All right, let's get going. Um, it's uh, 4.33. So um, it's my pleasure to welcome this group. Um, as you may remember on the GI side, um, that we had a proposal to set up a program that I call um, DHOA, Digestive Health in Older Adults. And we'd like to have ideally um, sort of a comprehensive multidisciplinary program where we focus on taking care of uh, um, older patients with GI symptoms. So um, that was the idea and, um, you know, start small and grow big, that's our effort. So uh, we thought that we are going to educate ourselves by uh, doing a series of presentations and uh, then distill what services we will build and uh, coalesce and align as we move along. So I, I look forward to a partnership between GI, GI surgery, and geriatric medicine. I'd like to thank uh, Laren Becker for being the spearhead for this effort. So uh, thank you for doing this. And we have two more uh, presentations that uh, Laren organized. So without further ado, I would like to have Laren um, get us going with uh, some introductions. Thanks, Ray. Um, it's not just me. I, I you know, I, I, I I've been working with Juliana, scheduling it for both um, getting the geri geriatric uh, colleagues involved. So the first uh, three, we've only come up with the three topics, and uh, the first one will be uh, constipation, pelvic floor. Uh, then we're going to uh, be doing it every other week. We'll have um, inflammation, microscopic colitis in two weeks. And then the final one will be esophageal disorders. This, the idea of this is um, learning how, you know, picking some problems that are clearly um, issues with the elderly uh, population, trying to find ways to uh, best co-manage, um, kind of introduce uh, means of communication between our geriatric colleagues, plus uh, discussing uh, specific, you know, there's some uh, ways that we need to tailor our treatments in GI towards the elderly population that's slightly different. So I think it's an important review for, for us as well. But um, I'd just like to uh, say that these are the three topics. If more topics come to mind, if there's other issues that, um, uh, we feel that are important uh, and could be covered, uh, should be covered, we could uh, certainly plan on having additional uh, sessions down the line. But I don't wanna um, uh, take any more time since I think uh, Layla and Brooke have, have lots to cover. So the first, again, the first session is covering constipation and pelvic floor uh, problems. And without any further ado, I will turn it over to, I think Layla is starting first. So newsflash. Yeah, so no, no. So let me just tell you, Layla and I talked on the way here, and we're gonna integrate the talks, right? So your whole point was integration, and I would say that nobody could do better. I'm not, I'm not saying nobody could do it better than us, but we happen to have a multidisciplinary conference. We happen to think a lot about this, so we sort of revisited this idea of having one and then the other, but maybe we would start with something, talk, and then kind of integrate them. So maybe we could all be open to sort of a, a new format and maybe the time would go quickly and everybody would enjoy it. And that is our goal. And then if it doesn't work, you don't have to do it again, but we'll be finished. And so we'll go from there. All right. So in fairness, I didn't title my first. Yeah, Brooke, what? I'm so sorry. Um, we are all for innovation. So um, this is what, you know, uh, we'd like to do. Um, so uh, that's great. I love that. But if you can take like one minute and yes. um, have uh, Juliana, Dr. Marwell to chime in in just a little bit and uh, oh, give please. her introduction of, of, of her perspective a little bit. Sorry, Brooke. Oh, thank you very much. So hi, I'm Juliana Marwell. I'm one of the geriatricians. You might um, see me either in the senior care clinic or the inpatient geriatrics consult service. And it's been great working with Dr. Kim and Dr. Becker. And I think um, we've had two of our other geriatric colleagues join us on the call, um, Dr. Tanover and Dr. Chen. So I don't know if you guys want to quickly introduce yourselves just to the group as well. Muted. I think you're muted. 
Yeah, I'm Lisa Tenover. I'm the senior member of geriatrics because I've been a geriatrician for more than 35 years. Um, and I've worked in all settings, but I would say um, for the last 20, it's been um, in outpatient. Thank you. But we see a lot of constipation. Hi, I'm Ken Chen. Uh, I'm a geriatrician and I mostly work in the skilled nursing facility setting. Uh, so we do also have a lot of uh, patients with constipation issues and also interested in learning more about esophageal uh, dysphagia. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. All right, should we get going? Yeah. I'm and very I sorry, Brooke. No, 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 please. And again, um, any way that you want to run it. And then Dr. Morrow, I think we had you, you joined us in some of our multidisciplinary conferences. So when Juliana first started, we thought, we thought to ourselves for pelvic floor, how could we integrate geriatrics into our decision making? Um, and she participated and was fantastic. And we brought up, you know, should we operate? Should we not? What do we need to do with patients? Um, and certainly it's fantastic to figure out how we can all work together. Um, so I'm going to, without further ado, let me just get started because then we can kind of take this talk in any direction. And then Layla, please, at any point you can jump in. Um, uh, and hopefully my internet will be stable because I'm supposed to be in the connected port and that doesn't seem to be working, but we're going to hope for the best. Um, all right. So I am going to share slot share slides and then please feel free to jump in if something um doesn't look right okay so you can see my slides i don't think i'm in the uh, master view yet can you see my slide in the master view yes okay so um I skipped over my intro slide because when I designed this, I didn't put Layla's name on it at the same time because I didn't realize, like we didn't realize we we're gonna do it this way. So this is a talk of mine and Layla kind of integrated together. And then I would say also, I do not have any disclosures for this. Uh, and let's put it like this. And then hopefully this won't skip. I'm gonna show you an animation that we created. Um, let's see how this looks. I'm Dr. Brooke can, can everybody hear it okay, or is it not loud enough? Rectal prolapse and erectocele in a female patient. Can you... It's good. We... It you sounds can good. It okay. Okay. It's it sounds a little louder, good. maybe. Okay. This image Wait, hold on one second. Then what I need to do. Of the female pelvis. Let me just stop for, share for one second and let me fix that for you. Um, so this is something that we kind of created after thinking a lot. Okay, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna reshare. Let's see if this, let me know if this is better. Hi, I'm Dr. Brooke Gerlin. All right, I'm gonna skip this because I don't, I hate hearing my voice. Let's start here. View of the female pelvis. In women, the uterus sits between the bladder and rectum. The rectum can be thought of as a tube. Chronic straining or poor tissue supports can lead to infolding of the rectal lining. Weak tissue supports between the rectum and vagina can lead to bulging of the front wall of the rectum into the back wall of the vagina, known as a rectocele. This Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do Hi, that. Hi, I'm Dr. Brooke Gerland, You'll and this video again. demonstrates rectal prolapse and a rectocele in a female patient. This image demonstrates a side view of the female pelvis. In women, the uterus sits between the bladder and rectum. The rectum can be thought of as a tube. Chronic straining or poor tissue supports can lead to infolding of the rectal lining. Weak tissue supports between the rectum and vagina can lead to bulging of the front wall of the rectum into the back wall of the vagina, known as a rectocele. This infolding is known as intussusception or internal rectal prolapse. Internal rectal prolapse and a rectocele can exist in the same patient. Stool can become trapped in the rectocele, making bowel movements difficult to evacuate, or there can be leakage of stool due to stool retention. Over time, the rectum may descend further through the rectal tube. 
and can narrow the lumen of the rectum, making it difficult to pass stool. When the rectal folds sit above the anus, the rectal tube may stretch the anal muscles. Chronic stretching of the anal muscles can lead to leakage of mucus, gas, or stool. When the rectal folds descend beyond the anal muscles, there is external rectal prolapse. All right, so this is giving you a view. Okay, hold on, I wanna go to the next. Okay, so um, this is an example, one of the examples about why someone or an elderly patient or really an any age patient, but certainly can impact the elderly, um, can have constipation due to anatomic reasons. Now, of course, if only it were as simple as that, um, there's many reasons for constipation, but this is giving you an idea about some of the anatomic things. And now I'm going to show you a little bit about what full thickness rectal prolapse looks like. And that is certainly one reason why someone can have um, constipation or difficult evacuation. And this is what full thickness rectal prolapse. And it's pretty, um, when you actually see it, it can be, uh, it, it can be pretty surprising. So this is something that Layla and I worked on together where we looked at patients who actually had prolapse and we said, what actually bothers you the most with regards to prolapse? And we looked at older patients and younger patients and what actually drove them coming into the clinic and being evaluated. And for geriatric patients, pain and fecal incontinence were the biggest drivers that really motivated them to be being seen. Um, whereas in younger patients, it was more difficult evacuation, and many of the patients complain about mu mucus discharge and bleeding. For a moment, I'm just going to focus on obstructed defecation. Even though it's a subset of this group of, of prolapse, this can be one of the most challenging, right? Like this, the symptoms of I can't get the stool out, um, and that's the obstructed defecation syndrome, more than six months, I have feeling of straining, incomplete evacuation, hard stools, less than three bowel movements per week. And Leila can elaborate on this. I'm only basically touching on this because we're constantly thinking about, is there an anatomic part? Is there more of a functional issue associated with the pelvic floor? And this is um, given, you know, I, I'm not touching at all on your medications, on all of the other reasons that you as medical doctors know all about, um, but thinking more in lines of the pelvic floor, constipation in the pelvic floor, and potentially anatomic things that you don't always think about. So when we think about defecation and pelvic floor muscles, you really need at the time of evacuation, those pelvic floor muscles need to, um, they need to follow a certain protocol, right? At rest, that, that, that the uh, angle of the rectum, the muscles need to keep the rectum intact at a certain angle, all right? And if they're too relaxed, then it doesn't hold it in place and there's issues with bowel control. But if those muscles never relax, all right, then it's difficult to evacuate the stool. And so when you think about elderly patients who don't have the same neurologic capability, who may have undergone a stroke, who lose coordination, and I would say it's, it's not unknown as persons reach a certain age, and I may also be reaching some of those ages, that you lose muscle mass as you go. And so just like you move, lose muscle mass in your biceps and other areas of your body, you certainly can lose that in your pelvic floor also. And we know that as far as pelvic floor defects that occur. So this is dysnergic defecation, which is the inability to coordinate abdominal and pelvic floor muscles to evacuate stool. We know that stress will impact that, all sorts of things. And we also know that biofeedback um, improves dysnergic defecation. When you compare it to sham, to standard biofeedback um, is better with 80% success rates. We also know that women who have prolapse also have a high degree of vaginal prolapse. So, and vaginal prolapse is very common. And by the age of 80, 50% 50 of women will have some sort of prolapse. So when I look at obstructed defecation as a surgeon. I am looking both at the, uh, I'm looking for reasons such as anatomic, which is the first animation I showed you, which is prolapse. 
I'm thinking about, is this a functional where they have this loss of coordination, dysnergic defecation? And then I'm saying, what do most patients? They're somewhere in the combined category. They have both anatomic and functional features. And that is where the interaction that Layla and I have together on evaluating these patients and maximizing them really comes into play. And then I would say where we fit in as far as working with the geriatricians and the other medical doctors is this specific patient eligible, healthy enough, willing to consider or be eligible for other interventions. Um, I'm going to show you another animation that talks about pelvic floor imaging because um, uh, I, Layla, what I'll do is I'll show this and then you can talk a little bit more about the testing. And one of the testing that we do is we, we, we look for a prolapse and there's this term internal prolapse and it is graded on our imaging. And then the big question is, is well, what do we do with this? Um, and so just grading score for rectal prolapse categorizes the descent of the rectum through the rectal and anal canal. Grade one refers to descent above the rectocele. Grade two to the level of the rectocele. So just to pause this, I'm never gonna operate on this, right? So if there's very early prolapse, that is more of a finding. So when you see that on an MRI, it's something I'm looking for. And those patients are gonna be treated with medical therapy and to, and to improve behaviors so that this never gets worse. So whenever we see that on an MRI, a very an early, a grade one or two, it just means that we see some infolding and there should be behavioral management for that to not to progress. Can I ask, now, this is the geriatrician asking, sure. how did the symptoms of this patient make it to you to even get an MRI if this isn't a surgical procedure? What was going on? What would be going on with them? So, so that's actually a great question. A lot of times I've been getting a, a lot of referrals for just MRIs with any sort of finding on there. So any kind of internal prolapse at this point, I'm usually getting, they're referred to me because it's it's not clear what you know, like nobody really understands what is the interplay. So we see that there is some prolapse. There may be some dysnergia. Um, we sort of just shoot everything at them. Like they get laxatives. They are a referral for pelvic floor PT, but that's such a resource. You can't even get the appointments. Um, they may be referred to see Layla and then they're referred to see me. Layla, maybe you want to comment on that also? Yes. Uh, yes. If I could share uh, now, again, yeah. I did my dear us uh, some of the... Please. Oh, perfect. So great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share here. And um, so I'm going to start with reminding you of the fact that, um, as you heard from uh, Brooke, defecation requires really increase in the in, uh, rectal pressures, which is usually uh, secondary to increase in the abdominal pressures. And this has to be coordinated with the anal relaxation. And in, uh, in patients with defecatory dysfunction, as you hear, there is this abdominal pelvic discoordination. And these are co uh, considered functional problems. And these patients are often presenting with constipation. So um, these patients will come with constipation when they are younger. But if you don't really address these problems proper, uh, properly, and as the time goes uh, in the elderly population specifically, these excessive straining over the years can weaken the pelvic floor and this can increase uh, the excessive perineal descent. It can cause the rectal intussusception, solitary ulcers, and also the pudendal neuropathy. And these can really uh, actually increase the risk of the uh, fecal incontinence. So in this uh, retrospective study of more than 40,000 patients, over 40% of the patients who were referred for anorectal physiologic testing had a combined uh, fecal incontinence and functional constipation. And, and these were really just picked up on the validated uh, criteria based on the questionnaires that the patients were asked to, uh, to uh, do. And otherwise the referrer, the doctors were not even uh, aware of this fact. 
And it's interesting to see that um, the differences exist with age. So it seems that the younger patients had more likely to be uh, uh, coming with constipation and less of the fecal incontinence. And in the uh, older age groups, there were more of the uh, symptoms of fecal incontinence and um, uh, just uh, as much of constipation. Regardless, patients who had coexistence of the fecal incontinence and constipation seem to be at 40%. They didn't look into the reason of the underlying ideology of these problems, but regardless, it seems that this is really common to have both problems and we have to ask the question. And it might be also to your interest to in, uh, know that uh, we think about pelvic floor dysfunction more commonly in younger patients, but the truth is that in women, there is a second peak uh, after age 80, and in men, the highest uh, incidence rate for the diagnosis of pelvic floor dysfunction is really in men older than 80, 80 to 90. So it's a really common problem in elderly. And um, I think if you really want to, uh, if you ask the patient about their symptoms, whether they have a combination of constipation, fecal incontinence, you want to really be sure to do a good rectal exam. Uh, this is um, somewhat a missing point, especially with the um, televisits. We don't really go by this. But the truth is that uh, you can really assess um, the anal resting tone, pelvic floor coordination. You can see if there is evidence of fecal soiling, if there is any anal fissure hemorrhage. And the, a good rectal exam has really a good um, uh, sensitivity and specificity for uh, understanding the pelvic floor dysfunction. And sometimes even uh, if you really do a good exam, you might be able to see uh, the presence of the rectal prolapse, which we are really not trained to do so. And I have been learning in our multidisciplinary evaluations from uh, Brooke and how to really go by that. But overall, the, the digital rectal exam is really an important part of the evaluation of any patient who has constipation. Um, but regarding the diagnosis, the official diagnosis, we usually go with the ROM criteria. Uh, for geriatrician, um, I want to say that ROM is our um, classic, um, classic uh, classification system for you know, functional GI disorders. And based on the ROM criteria, a patient who has constipation uh, or uh, IBS with constipation, we need to do anorectal physiologic testing for us to be able to make the diagnosis of functional defecatory disorders or uh, diagnosis of pelvic floor dysfunction. And of these tests, usually we start with the anorectal manometry and um, this is a catheter-based testing. It's really painless. It's very easy. Um, the patient doesn't need to be prepped for this procedure. Uh, the, uh, there are pressure sensors that are mounted um, around the catheter, and the catheter uh, can be placed in the rectum while the patient is lying on the left side, um, and um, we can evaluate uh, the uh, anorectal motion, uh, the spinal reflexes, and also evaluate the sensation of the rectum with this balloon that is uh, attached to the tip of the uh, anal probe. And as you can see during uh, the evacuation in a normal person, this is the heat map that is basically picking up on the uh, evacuation uh, dynamics. When the rectal pressures are increasing, there is a normal relaxation of the anal sphincter. But uh, in this test, in patients who have this energetic defecation, there can be an, a, a paradoxical contraction in the anal sphincter. When the patient is trying to relax these muscles, they are inadvertently increase and contract their pelvic floor. Or they can be just not relaxing to the level that is required, and that's usually more than 20% of relaxation. At the same time, some patients have also difficulty with increasing their propulsive forces or intrarectal pressures. And this can be really a good ideology for causing constipation or uh, abnormal evacuation as well. 
We also do the balloon expulsion test in conjunction with the anorex manometry. This is when uh, we put a 50 ml water filled balloon in the rectum and the patient will be given 60 seconds in privacy to try to evacuate this balloon uh, on the commode. And uh, we know that if the time is more than 60 seconds, this test is abnormal and indicates abnormal uh, defecation or uh, uncoordinated defecation. If the two tests are not giving you the results of this energetic defecation, then we can utilize defecography. More recently, we have been using more of the MR defecography because it can provide a lot of information about all three compartments uh, of the evacuation. And at the same time, you can see there's no uh, radiation and you can really pick up on the structure of pathologies also. Because uh, again, like these patients, if you don't really address the constipation, they can develop uh, functional uh, pathologies can lead to the structural pathologies. Like here in this patient, as you can see, this is at rest. Here is the patient pushing, trying to evacuate. As you can see, there is no uh, really gel coming out of the anus. The anus is completely closed, despite the fact that the patient is pushing. And also there is a small rectocil in the front that you can see here. Uh, and this is formed because of the uh, dyssynergic defecation here. So there are some changes in normal healthy controls with aging as well. So I have to say that uh, we know in people who don't have constipation or any symptoms, aging is associated with decrease in the resting uh, anal tone and uh, easier evacuation with the increase in the rectal anal pressures. And also the time to evacuate the balloon seems to be really correlating with increased age. And this is gonna be much easier at older age. And based on the MR defecography, we know that again, the top panel here is belonging to a young woman. The lower panel shows the evacuation and squeeze at older, in an older patient. A uh, person, actually, these are the normal healthy controls, and it seems that rectal evacuation is much less in the, elder, uh, in the uh, elderly, uh, despite not having any significant symptoms of constipation. And also the motions uh, during the squeeze seems to be affected by age, and the anorectal angle is affected by age as well. So um, these are happening with aging that we know, but why uh, the defecatory disorders are much more common in the elderly, that's still an area that we are um, trying to answer. And I think we are gonna have some slides to show there too. Should I turn it back to, uh, oh, no, did no, I answer no. the testing? Yeah, you, you go a little bit more because it's the non, you keep going. Yes, okay. So here, I, I think um, I, uh, I would go on the approach and management of uh, constipation overall. And again, I think uh, this is the slide you saw. This is really important to know that the symptoms in elderly population can be different from the younger patients. So it's really important to ask for the symptoms on that patients uh, is bothered a bit and try to understand because you have to really address uh, the bother for the patient that can be different um, in the elderly. Um, in terms of the approach to the patients with uh, constipation and symptoms related to obstructive defecation, um, here, we usually start uh, with addressing the symptoms um, more with habit training uh, and uh, improving uh, the stool form. And uh, this can be with or without rectal irrigation. So stepwise approach is what we recommend. And um, we, uh, we want this to be you know, through the lifestyle modification, and hopefully uh, with the minimal uh, medications. And the reason for that is because of the polypharmacy being such a huge deal, especially in the geriatrics and the older patients. In terms of the habit training, I think this is um, 
really a simple form of behavioral therapy that we don't really um, utilize as much in US. But uh, this can involve optimizing the uh, diet and uh, maximizing the gastrocolonic response, which is usually happening after the breakfast in the morning. And you can really cluster that, um, uh, the, uh, the contractions in the colon that are important for uh, expelling the stool to the rectum uh, to help with the evacuation. Uh, you want to increase the hydration, talk to the patient about their fiber intake, their diet, uh, their uh, basically scheduled toilet training, uh, avoid the straining, avoid digital uh, disimpaction, uh, try to spend not too long in the bathroom. These are all really important in terms of their position on the commode, uh, utilizing the diaphragmatic breathing. They have been really all simple tools that have been shown to be really important for improving the symptoms of constipation. In a recent Wait, clinical trial. Can I comment? Can, can yes, you go yes. back for one second on that? And I just want to comment. So I'm seeing patients um, who are under consideration for surgery, and I will say that I won't even consider surgery until I've discussed all of these things with them. And, I, and I'm sure many of you do, anyone who takes care of patients, I'm sure that you do a lot of it. And I would say one of the gaps I feel like in healthcare overall is that, is that people need coaches. Like they don't just need to hear it once from us. Like somebody needs to reaffirm it again. And then when they don't make the lifestyle changes, someone needs to say, well, why didn't you make the lifestyle changes? And like, we see them as doctors and we make series of recommendations, but we can't really hold their hand through all of them. And that's, and like, I, I would say many, many people get better with this, but it's really the motivated people. And if, if I had, not that this is what this forum is for, but if I had one thing that I wish that we had as part of our care it would be like healthcare coaches and their entire job would be to just make sure that people take the medications that they need and do the things and do all of these habit training, which I would hundred percent believe should be done before, you know, considering any kind of intervention. Okay, so. This is Lisa Tenover, the geriatrician again, <laughs> and I agree. The other thing is, is that it's just difficult to get patients to do much of anything and to do it right, okay? Um, even constipation, like you give them some, say you're going to give them something for like polyethylene glycol and some, to, you know, to tell them to sort of titrate it. They can't do it or they don't do it. So they never even get past phase one. I mean, some of the easy things like getting a stool when you sit on the potty, I mean, that one, that one's not so hard. But a lot of this stuff with medicines, they don't take it right. Uh, more fluid, forget it. They've got nocturia and they got to go to the bathroom all the time and they have urinary incontinence and they're not going to do the fluid. And so it's really hard even to get past this stuff to get it to the point where they would be willing to have surgery. Absolutely. And um, motivation is going to be really the most important part and really believing in that is going to be the most important part. And um, to further expand on that and really like um, go uh, with the fact that we need more help and support in the clinic for that, I want you to look at this clinical trial that was uh, done um, in uh, London, and um, they had three groups of patients. More than 180 patients was recruited for this trial, and uh, they had uh, patients with constipation either go for the habit training or you know, they were given habit, tra uh, habit training uh, in terms of the uh, lifestyle modification as well as the biofeedback and they had a third group that actually they really invested in them. Uh, the invest group had all the anorectal physiologic testing. They had um, excessive uh, testing with the uh, transit time and they really uh, guided their therapy in terms of the biofeedback towards the findings of the anorectal manometry. And uh, they show that in three groups, um, uh, all these uh, patients really had improvement of their uh, symptoms of constipation. And the symptom-related quality of life also improved in all three groups to the same uh, amount. And um, these are really long-lasting interventions that lasted for more than 12 months for these patients.
And as you can imagine, the uh, group that had uh, habit training only, uh, they were uh, the most cost-effective intervention as compared to the other group, and they had just as much improvement of their symptoms. However, I have to say that this habit training here was really done through the standardized protocol and it was led by the trained nurses. And this is how they reported that this can be utilized as a very cost-effective intervention when it's offered through the nurses and nurses who are trained and who can communicate the plan with the patients. So you know, this is very important that um, if we had more support in the clinic, this would have been really you know, a better intervention uh, for many of the, especially in the geriatrics group again. Um, but um, there are also a lot uh, of medications that can be utilized for you know, management of constipation. Um, of course, in the elderly patients, we know that the fiber works and it can really accelerate the intestinal transit. However, these symptoms um, may be persistent or inconsistent in some patients, it may work better than the other ones. Uh, if uh, this is Lisa Ten over again. I have to tell you, we don't use psyllium for constipation, except for in people who have problems with the final defecation. And that's because they don't drink enough fluid and it actually makes it worse. We use psyllium for diarrhea because <laughs> yes. it absorbs the water, just to let you know, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, it is actually uh, making a lot of sense uh, to hear that. Uh, because absolutely it's uh, gonna only work if um, the, uh, the hydration is there. So uh, thank you. Um, I, I didn't realize actually this is such a huge problem in your clinics and of course for us to learn. Um, in terms of the probiotics. I think it was mentioned earlier that you can't hold your patient's hands. And I really disagree with that because if you watch how clinical trials are conducted, particularly in patients with constipation. Almost every subject keeps a diary, and that seems to lock the subjects in to taking their medication, uh, to doing all the other things that are involved in a clinical trial. And I've, I've found that many physicians uh, don't really have a meaningful understanding of how you conduct a diary study or what you do with the data. And their approach seems to be to see the patients in the clinic from time to time and take a history and let it go at that. And I'd encourage you to include diaries in everything you do, whether it's, whether it's in sur before surgery or before any other sort of uh, interaction. One other thing related to clinical trials is in many of the agents that you've got on your slide right now, the trials exclude the existence of hemorrhoids. And one of the results is that the patients may be cured of their constipation, but they go crazy because they've still got their hemorrhoids and it hurts. That's it, thank you. Thank you, thank you. and. Um... Definitely valid points, and thank you. Um, and uh, yes, uh, absolutely important to address the patient's um, concerns, and that's for sure the first thing to consider. But in terms of the laxatives, I think um, I want to say that remind you that the probiotics are um, not uh, quite shown to be beneficial in improving the symptoms of constipation. There is not enough data, although patients seem to like it very much. And um, if patients don't really uh, have a proper response to fiber, we usually start with osmotic laxatives and, uh, uh, or moving to stimulant laxatives as the first line of therapy. And it's important to know that these are really just as effective and much less expensive as compared to the uh, secretogogues or prokinetics, especially in the elderly population. And um, here, um, um, I know uh, many patients are on colase and they love it, but uh, really it's not shown to be any better than placebo. 
And in terms of uh, the osmotic laxatives, specifically uh, polyethylene glycol, lactulose, and sorbitol, uh, there have been some studies in the elderly population, who, uh, and they all show that they can be very effective in improving the symptoms of constipation. Um, and uh, they are very safe. Uh, they are not associated with uh, malabsorption. The electrolyte abnormalities are not commonly seen on these uh, medications. If there is any diarrhea that can happen with these osmotic laxatives, uh, adjusting the dose usually adjusts those problems in elderly, and you can utilize them uh, very safely. There is evidence for Senna in the elderly population as well, and it has been really, uh, be even better than lactulose and fiber for addressing the constipation, improving the transit time in elderly. And regarding the stimulant laxatives with the visacodial, I think a practical approach for uh, most of us is to really keep the patient on an osmotic laxative uh, and use it uh, regularly and use the bisacodyl maybe in the form of a suppository or glycerin suppositories uh, if there are persistent con uh, constipation symptoms. And um, usually we want the suppositories to be administered in 15 to 30 minutes after the morning meal. And again, this is to help it uh, coinciding the gastrocolonic reflex with the uh, with, uh, to help with the evacuation. In terms of the newer drugs, uh, the best evidence uh, comes from the use of uh, pro, uh, calopride, which is the 5-HD4 receptor agonist. And it's perfectly fine uh, to use them in the elderly population. It's very safe. The side effects in terms of the cardiovascular side effects have been really uh, not a concern in the elderly. And so uh, it has been shown in the large scale clinical trials to improve the, the symptoms of constipation in elderly population. In terms of the secretive box, the best evidence so far has been from the Lubiprost and the clinical trials for the linaclotide were underpowered for the older patients. And um, in terms of the placanotide, this was a uh, uh, post hoc analysis that I was pulled into, and this will be presented in the ACG uh, in fall. And uh, it showed that placanotide is just as effective in the uh, patients over age 60 as it is in the younger patients. And so uh, this is uh, actually with no uh, adverse effects um, uh, that can be uh, concerning. And so it seems to be a good option for elderly patients uh, again here too. Another uh, underutilized intervention in US is transanal irrigation. And uh, this is much more common and popular uh, in Europe. And uh, there are um, a lot of uh, different forms of the small or low volume uh, transanal irrigation, as well as the high volume transanal irrigation systems that are widely and commercially available. And this clinical trial, again, uh, it, was uh, it was conducted in Europe, and they showed that uh, the survival rate uh, showed that um, the persistent benefit of the irrigation lasted over a year for patients who were using it. And um, it seems that uh, the high volume rectal irrigation can be even more uh, plausible to patients with constipation. So um, they suggested that for patients who have uh, chronic constipation, who did not really uh, have uh, optimal improvement of their symptoms uh, with the uh, oral medication, they may benefit from the transanal irrigation, although this uh, study again was not really for the elderly. And um, I have to say that this is uh, quite an inv uh, invasive procedure and it might be associated with some anxiety and not the best option for the elderly population, uh, but uh, something to consider uh, for really difficult patients. And with that, I want to also uh, talk about the fecal impaction. And um, this is usually in the setting of the chronic and severe constipation. Uh, it can be really much more common in the uh, chronically ill and elderly frail patients. And these are the patients who have had constipation forever. And all of a sudden, all that is uh, out there is 
uncontrolled diarrhea or fecal incontinence, which is because of the overflow. And um, we have to be very careful with our evaluation and understanding that the problem is in the fecal impaction and uh, it's associated with increased morbidity and mortality. If it's not addressed, it can cause perforation and really peritonitis and really grave uh, uh, problems. So uh, the management here uh, for the patients who will come to you with the symptoms of diarrhea is not to really give them Imodium, but you really want to go, uh, go with the uh, digital disimpaction and use enemas uh, to help with the evacuation. So uh, these are for the constipation in patients who uh, have um, uh, who uh, come uh, to you without any testing before you do any testing. But of course, if the patient uh, comes back and you can't really address the constipation symptoms, this is, as you heard from Dr. Gela, this is when um, we are going to be addressing in the patients who have this energy defecation biofeedback therapy. And uh, biofeedback therapy is um, instrument-based um, behavioral therapy that the physiotherapist will help uh, the patient to understand uh, the, uh, the uh, contraction in their anal sphincter or abnormal propulsive like uh, rectal evacuation. They try to correct the dysenergia. They will help the patient to uh, have a better evacuation. Uh, we know that majority of our patients, uh, over 50% of them have rectal sensory dysfunction, and they can uh, actually help with the patient uh, use, the, uh, use um, uh, the balloon training for um, addressing the uh, rectal sensory dysfunction. And um, we know that it's also helpful for the elderly population. And this is uh, to know from this small uh, clinical trial that even the older patients can benefit from the biofeedback. So don't be shy of sending your patients for biofeedback if they are older. But uh, of course, uh, irrespective of age, um, the outcome requires really adequate physical and mental capacity. So the patient should be able to participate uh, in, the, in the plan of care. So um, here, uh, again, uh, if we come back and the patient's symptoms are still not improving, and here is really when we are going to be looking into the multidisciplinary care, again, coming back to see uh, what is there to be really addressed. Uh, sit down uh, with uh, all the parties involved. Addressing the uh, psychological comorbidities can be very important for many of these patients. And anxiety can be a huge driver of these symptoms at any age group, including the uh, older patients, as you heard. And so it's important to uh, address those. Maybe we can hear from uh, Dr. Gerland about when um, you will consider surgery for the patients uh, with the rectal prolapse, uh, or uh, what would be, uh, what do we know about uh, the potential? Wait, wait, but before you stop sharing, go back to your slide for a second, um, and where you have the impaction one. And I would just, I would kind of elaborate on the fact that there's the category of patient who, um, who when they go to move their bowels, they don't relax, or they do the opposite, or they poor, have poor relaxation, or again, they contract their muscles or where you have that impaction one. And there's this category of patient where you have the fecal impaction who they have no strength at all that they can't push anything out. And so I think we know it from the exercise studies. I think you know it from the elderly and being able to get up, but imagine like, just like they can't get themselves up and down from the chair, they also don't have the strength to push out a bowel movement. And so uh, it makes me think, you know, we tend to treat people afterwards when they have a problem with things like with bio, whether it be biofeedback or training. And again, pelvic floor physical therapy is not just about Kegels. It's about using the full range of the pelvic floor. And so I think because the pelvic floor muscles are hidden, we tend to not pay as much attention and maybe there should be something more pro you know, we should be thinking along the lines as, as people are losing other strength, you know, again, if this was possible, um, that they should also be kind of, they should be focusing on pelvic floor muscles. Um, so, yep. So th those are just my thoughts as far as constipation, as constipation, because I would say from my perspective, 
when someone is constipated, um, when this is not treated, I really can't help with the other things such as the pain from the hemorrhoids or large hemorrhoids that, that hang out. Because if the constipation is not treated, whatever I do with the hemorrhoids will just be undone afterwards from the chronic straining. And then if there is prolapse that can potentially be modifiable, if we've already shown in our own series that if your bowel consistency is like a bristle stool one or two, you don't have the right consistency that your likelihood of coming back of, um, of prolapse returning is even higher. And so from that perspective, really the, the most important thing is gonna be about modifying the stool, right? If you wanna unshare. Um, like what you're talking about is frailty. And do you do a formal evaluation of frailty when you have a patient who uh, is just so weak they can't move their pelvic muscle? Um, so I would say that I don't, so I do a formal frailty when I may, I use that as a, to help me with decision-making for surgery. So maybe that, that thank you for that lead in. I really appreciate that. So I'm going to, I'm going to just show you what, how, when I think about prolapse and it, and I would say hemorrhoids are a little bit different. I try to avoid doing hemorrhoids or doing office space. Cause you mentioned hemorrhoids before, but when I'm thinking about prolapse, which certainly can be present and contributing, I'm thinking about functional improvement, durability, and I need a low risk profile. Um, and when I'm making a decision, what's gonna currently, what, what will be important is about what is your, what is the surgeon expertise? And, and I, I say that in that there's a number, like there's over a hundred different operations that are reported for rectal prolapse. So where are you trained? What you know how to do makes a difference. What are past, your past surgical history? Because that may impact. What are your comorbidities? And in there, I would say, what is your frailty index as an important factor? And then again, a little bit about patient preference because they may decide they want mesh, they don't want mesh, they don't want a longer anesthesia time and all of those things kind of factor in. Um, what when we're thinking, and I'm going to I'm going to come to your your frailty kind of indices. When we're, what we know about for rectal prolapse, I have an apple and an orange. Like these are two different patient categories, like the apples and the oranges of who I'll offer different things to. So abdominal procedures. So an abdominal approach to correcting prolapse, I tend to do on a healthier patient. Um, and the reason, well, it's it's because it's more of an it's. Um, I can do it with the small incisions, but it is a, it takes a little bit longer and it puts a little bit more stress on the um, on your overall physiologic system. But the but there's a lower recurrence rate, and we can't show that in randomized trials because there's very small, crappy studies for randomizing rectal prolapse patients. But in the larger series, it's about the recurrence rate is about ten percent. The perineal operations, and perineal means that the prolapse is operated on from below, right? It's many times done with general anesthesia, but can also be done with a spinal. And so one of the things is, you know, that with, our, with how good we are with anesthesia now, we can offer very sick patients anesthesia, but these are quality of life procedures. So um, with perineal operations, there are different uh, options from an anesthetic perspective. Um, and it's a faster operation to do, uh, but there are definitely higher recurrence rates. Um, and then in both groups, there tends to be low complications, no matter which one you look at. And so when we talk about the decision-making, and this again is where I'm going to talk about how I look at frailty, um, is the anatomic repair, is fixing the prolapse going to correct functional complaints? I have to think about, is the patient optimized? What comorbidities? Is it rectal prolapse alone versus multi-compartment? Are the pelvic floor muscles coordinated? Like, have I addressed all of those other interventions? How are their bowel movements? Do they have any voiding dysfunction? Because that, again, could put pressure and improve. And are they emotionally ready? Like, that's the decision making. Where are they with it? And this is where I currently, so I've gone through many different frailty sort of things that I could use in clinic. I used to do what I called, you know, the Brooke Erland frailty index, which I would take a look at how they looked, were they well-dressed or not, was someone taking care of them? I'd have them walk up and down across the room. Could they get onto the table by themselves? Did they not? Then I went to the standardized one with the get up and go, and I tried a number. And now the one that I've been using based on the fact that I needed as simple as possible to be part of a clinical care um, is the RAI, which is Dr. Shipper Aria, who's in our vascular surgery. She uses that one. And I've been looking at our 
studies with that. Um, because what I, what I need to know, right? Like I know who's the sickest and I know who's the healthiest. I can have an 85 year old patient who is, looks like they're 60, who goes out, who's hiking, who's doing fantastic things. They're healthy. But then I have someone in between who I can't really tell. They have a few comorbidities. They seem okay. I don't really know. And that this is where that index really helps me. Um, because I need to know, can I offer people who might be a little bit sicker, a more durable abdominal repair? And so I this say one of the other issues in geriatrics yes. is not only where they are themselves, but what support they have to take care of them when they get home. Oh my God. So important. And that's, and, and part of my conversations with someone is where are you going afterwards? What's happening? Because what I what I've told what I've noticed is that people were kind of on the borderline of either living alone or whatever their support was, and now you go to do a surgical procedure on them, and now I've changed everything up. They don't recover right away, and so that is a super important part of me even considering. And because I'm doing quality of life, and it's not cancer, and it's not life threatening, I actually have the luxury of saying, "Wait a second, you're not quite ready." Um, all right. They have a great point. So, um, so with, with this tool, we're looking, how can we facilitate the shared decision-making and help set patient expectation? And this is just a little bit of what we did in our own clinic, looking at kind of our tools. We, I looked to see, was there any difference if I was doing abdominal perineal? I, I actually not so important. This is just our own, our own data. Cause it's getting late and you don't need to see, but we looked at abdominal operations and perineal. And of course the age of the patients we did perineal, which much higher, uh, most of them are women. And then on this risk index, the abdominal operations were more like 20 and perineal operations were over 30 and more than 30 is considered frail. And they had a lot more co cardiac comorbidities and they were a higher ASA. Um, but what, interesting enough, there was no difference in the incontinence scores. That's the fecal incontinence score or the obstructive defecation score. But what we did see on this one, looking at the changes, oh, this is actually a breakdown um, certainly operative time is much longer in the abdominal operations, but I do a lot of combined. We sometimes do the um, with the with vaginal prolapse also more commonly. And so this is a little bit of a breakdown of the operative procedures, which isn't really relevant right now. Um, and then characteristics, the perineal people stayed about 2.2 days opposed to 1.6. And really what you see is the difference is the recurrence rates. Abdominal procedures had a lower recurrence rates than the 34% of the perineal. And this is looking at the scores, incontinence scores before and after. And this is um, for incontinence and then constipation. And you see that no matter what, everybody got better. Their, their scores went down if they had one versus the other. Uh, and then when we asked them what they call PGIC, which how did your, you know, since undergoing prolapse surgery, how would you describe your change, if any, in symptoms and overall quality of life? And every, most people said that they were improved as long as the prolapse wasn't there. And so that didn't make a difference. So I would say that patients undergoing the perineal repairs, really, they did have a baseline more fecal incontinence, more fecal incontinence at baseline, um, post-operative function improved with both, and everybody was more or less satisfied. Um, so I'm going to stop here just on the interest of time and any questions and just say some of our future work is going to be about using the RAI and really showing how I can make decisions on it and how I can move people who are a little bit frail, improve them, and then be able to do an operation on them that is more durable. And... Yep, I don't know if you, if Layla, you wanted to kind of show some of that, just some of that other work. I know we are heading time and stuff. Because I see. You uh, yes, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, um, I just want to uh, show uh, that uh, coming back to the frailty and sarcopenia being a really marker of the frailty. In this work, we looked at, at the effect of the psoas um, fat fraction as well as the cross-sectional area with relationship to increased pelvic floor relaxation and higher grades of the rectal prolapse and you know, pelvic organ prolapse. And we showed that um, in patients who had a higher psoas fat fraction, 
uh, the uh, pelvic floor relaxation was mo much more uh, prominent and there was a correlation between the two, as well as the uh, higher grades of erectile prolapse. And these were not consistent with the pelvic floor muscles fat fraction, which was the puborectalis fat fraction. So we really think that the uh, frailty has a lot to do with the pelvic uh, organ prolapse and pelvic floor relaxation. Thank you. If there are any questions, I guess. Yeah, maybe you want to stop sharing for a second. And, and that also, we should probably just recognize also Dr. Brecker's input, always taking some tissue samples and looking at immune function. And really, there's going to be some integration of all of this and, and thinking about pelvic floor disorders as a chronic condition. Right, just like we think about diabetes now as a chronic condition, another that that this is really fits into that same category and the immune response and what's happening at a tissue level um, are all uh, incredibly important. If I may add a couple of points, uh, ladies. Um, the first point has to do with the role of sensation. And poor erectile sensation diminishes the internal awakening, if you will, of our bodies to evacuate. And that's quite prominent in the patient population with particularly neuropathy such as diabetes, spinal stenosis, etc. So that is an important piece in the equation that I think probably needs a little bit more uh, refinement. The second thing that I see a lot in the elderly population is um, diverticular disease, particularly of the sigmoid colon causing structures and thickening of the wall of the sigmoid, the rectus sigmoid colon. And I was wondering what your thoughts are, what is the role that that particular element uh, playing in the induction of the symptoms of constipation of the obstructive type? And what are your thoughts, uh, Brooke? I mean, I, I would say that there is a subcategory that does have a big overlap with functional and diverticulitis, but uh, this is all I see all day. And I will tell you that's, that's not, doesn't seem to be the majority. It's, it's not that there isn't a subgroup and there are times where we can see some thickening, but we image all of them. I, I would say with the, I see more prolapse related to um, overall weakness of the pelvic floor than to the diverticulitis, but definitely worth thinking about and is its own classification. Well, I was not referring to the diverticulitis. I was referring to the thick and structured sigmoid. The, the, oh. the patients, particularly elderly, who uh, you cannot actually drive the scope through well, uh, yeah, very challenging. yes, that that is something I'm, you know, if we all warrant that we think we can't evaluate it and that this is structured, that to me is something that's definitely worth considering surgery as part of a multidisciplinary group. Like, again, if we think it's been, we have to make that decision. Is it benign? Is it not? Is the function worse? How sick is the patient? You know, the, the thing about anesthesia now is we can really operate on anyone. So we have to weigh the, what is the likelihood that this will completely obstruct versus can we wait this out because we think it's a benign process or is the function so bad that we need to intervene between that? And that's where I think the nuances come in and you have to bring everybody to the table um, to say their, their piece um, because our ultimate goal is to get a patient alive out of the hospital and then back home to do the things that they were doing before. Hi, thank you both so much. I just wanted um, to say thank you for those behavioral approaches. I think it's really nice to think about the biopsychosocial and multidisciplinary approach and how I can bring these recommendations into my care. I suspect that there'll be more opportunities um, to, to um, discuss this, but it just for the geriatric colleagues, uh, Dr. Craven is our, 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 our only and best and uh, the newest and the latest uh, uh, GI psychologist. So uh, um, just wanted to let you know that uh, we started working together and perhaps there's a 
I'm sure there's a lot of uh, collaboration that we can consider uh, in this older uh, patient population. Lauren, do you want to close for us? Great talks, um, Leila and uh, Brooke. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, very comprehensive. And I think it's um, just a good review for GI uh, folks alone, um, let alone our geriatricians. Uh, but I just want to um, say that the the format of these talks um, are is flexible. This was this worked out great. I think we learned a ton. Um, future ones um, there if there are um, some more questions that uh, are like cases or ger uh, um, uh, questions that the geriatricians have uh, about uh, co, co managing when when to refer. If any of that uh, comes up, we could certainly have uh, sessions where there's more uh, discussion. Uh, I think this worked great because I think you guys were both very uh, thorough and, and covered uh, so much. So uh, there's not much time left, but um, thank you very much. The next one will be, um, I think uh, Kian is uh, giving, uh, presenting about um, uh, covering uh, inflammation, microscopic colitis, and IBD management in the elderly. And uh, then the, the final one uh, at the end of the month will be esophageal disorders. Um, and John will be giving that. So uh, I, unless there's any further questions, I don't know, or any other discuss, uh, points of discussion, um, I think we could close it. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for joining everybody. Appreciate Thanks. It. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.